Hello, everyone. Uh, we are going to finish today Judah the priest and his interesting but complex stories. And we're going to look at a number of stories of his uh, that are related to uh, him uh, specifically in his relationship with the Roman emperor, the emperor of the whole Roman empire. Um, so we're using the same materials as last time. Um, and I've lost my copy. Which told me which ones we're going to do. So everybody have the materials? Diane and David, do you have the materials? And Bonnie? Okay. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we're going to... We're going to skip a few pages from where we were last time. Um, and uh, we're going to begin on page 266, 266. <clears throat> and number 311. The normal G minus starting. Rabbi made a feast for his disciples, serving them tongues that were tender as well as tongues that were tough. They proceeded to select the tender tongues and passed up the tough ones. So he said to them, take heed of what you are doing. Even as you select the tender and pass up the tough, so let your tongues be tender, gentle toward one another. Oh, that's nice. Sweet, sweet, now my sweet. mother used to cook tongue. It was disgusting. <laughs> right. Not too often anymore, right? <laughs> No. Box was, oh, it was horrible. I mean, maybe it tasted good. good, but the thought of it was disgusting. <laughs> Children were not going to listen to that. But, uh, okay. Uh, let's go down to uh, 314. These are just stories of, uh, of what kind of guy he was. All right, 314. The story is told of 13 brothers, 12 of them dialed, died childless whose widows came before Rabbi, asking to marry the surviving brother. Rabbi said to him, go and take them and liberate marriage. The brother, I do not have the means to maintain all of them, the widows. Each of us will maintain the household for one month during the year, the brother. But who will maintain it during the 13th month that is interrelated? Rabbi, I will maintain the household during that month. He prayed in their behalf and they went away. After three years, they came carrying 36 babies, came and stood in front of Rabbi's house. Rabbi was told a village of babies are here to greet you. Rabbi looked out of a window and saw them. He asked, what brings you here, the women? We are here to ask that you maintain us during this 13th month. So that month, Maintain them, he did. <laughs> it's a sweet story, huh? Sweet story. 36, a whole village of babies. Yeah. yeah. Takes a village. Yeah, it takes a village. Uh, all right, yeah, we're not 3.15. Rabbi came out of the bathhouse, wrapped himself in his garments, and sat down to attend to the people's needs. The rabbi's servants mixed a cup of water and wine for him. Rabbi was so busy attending to people's needs that he could not spare a moment to take it from his servant, who kept holding it until he dozed off. Then Rabbi turned and gazed at him and said, Solomon put it well. Sweet is the sleep of the laboring man, whether he eat little or much. But the satiety of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Ecclesiastes 511. Those rich in Torah like ourselves, are so busy attending to the people's needs that we are not even allowed to sleep. <laughs> it's a nice feeling as someone who's devoted to the people. I, yeah. I, I, I remember, uh, well, what? So the, here here we hear about the mixing wine, right? Because back then, back then, they used to drink wine like water. Like, oh. they, instead of drinking water, they used to drink wine. So they were... Oh. You used to mix it with water and then you would not satisfy so drink all day long. Um, but I, I remember once I was at a uh, a big conference for world religious leaders in Israel, and I was I was just I was a volunteer before I became a rabbi. I was all the top leaders, and there was this Buddhist leader from Burma, 
and <clears throat> he was uh, seemed a really special guy. Um, but who knew this? But there's a whole bunch of Burmese workers in Israel, and so at the end of the conference, like at eight or nine, all these Burmese workers came from all over Israel to see this great teacher who was there, and he spent hours with them, sitting on a bench, and come to see him one after the other, and he would talk to them and spend time with them. And I thought, wow, that's that's what you know, that's something you know. So get this uh, get this picture with uh, of Rabbi. Rabbi here and then so so attending to people. Um, all right, I wanted to give that picture of him before we start to get to the stories of him and and to Antoninus. Um, okay, um, let's start um, on the following page. Do you want to continue or do you want to give it over? No, all right. So we're on page two hundred and sixty-seven. Um, let's start at 319 and we'll just read through them. Our rabbi instructed Rav Aphis, write a letter in my behalf to our Lord, the Emperor Ant Antoninus. So he wrote, from Judah the Patriarch to our Lord Emperor Antoninus. Rabbi took it, read it, and tore it up. Then he said, write from your servant Judah. To our Lord Emperor Antoninus, Rabbi Theus said, Master, why do you make it so little of your dignity? Rabbi replied, Am I better than my ancestor Jacob? Did not Jacob say, Thus saith thy servant Jacob? That was, yeah. and that was when Jacob was trying to placate Esau, where right? he was coming back from being away for 21 years, and Esau's coming his way to kill him, and so he's he knows you have to placate the powerful. Um, so saying he he knew how to play the, the Roman emperor it's not good he was a very wise person wise person right yeah and in those days they had to I mean this is what the rabbis learned if you if you push back against Rome then Rome pushes back against you and unfortunately they have a lot more more legions than you do um well, let's go 321. It happened once that when Antonius came to Caesarea, he sent for our holy rabbi, who arrived accompanied by his son, Rab Simeon, and by Rab Haya the Elder. When Rab Simeon saw there a legion whose soldiers were calmly strong and so tall that their heads seemed to reach the capitals of columns, he said to Rab Haya, See how fattened Esau's calves are? Rav Haya then took Rav Simeon and led him to the marketplace where he saw a basket of grapes and figs with flies buzzing over them. Rav Haya said, these flies and that legion are alike. Later, when Rav Simeon came up to his father's home, he said, this is what I said to Rav Haya, and that is how he replied to me. Rabbi commented, Rav Haya the Babylonian ascribed too much substance to them by likening them to flies. These legions are regarded by God as nothing at all, but flies through them. God executes his commission. So he might have been, he might be nice to the emperor, but he doesn't think very highly of the Romans there. No. And, uh, yeah. Uh, next one, please. Antonius asked Rabbi, why does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? Rabbi, were it the other way around, you would have asked the same question, Antonius. My question still stands. Why should the sun set in the west? Why does it not return to the east where it is risen or to any other point in the sky? Rabbi, the sun sets in the west to make obeisance to its maker. As is said, the host of the heavens makes word I love, obeisance to thee. Antonius, and let the sun go midway in heaven, make up CSNs, and let set at once. Rabbi, for the sake of workers and wayfarer, the sun sinks gradually. Hmm. Pretty stupid question. Yeah, it's crazy. Let's go on. Antonius asked our holy rabbi, is one allowed to pray every hour? It is forbidden. Antonius, why? Rabbi, so that one should not become irreverent toward the Almighty. 
Antonius refused to accept this explanation. Why did our holy rabbi do? What did our holy rabbi do? Early in the morning, he went to the palace of Antonius and called out, Hail, O Lord. An hour later, he came again. Hail, Emperor. Another hour. Peace upon you, O King. At this, Antonius asked, Why do you treat royalty with such contempt? Rabbi replied, Let your ears hear what your mouth utters. If you, who are no more than flesh and blood, characterize him who salutes you every hour as one who holds you in contempt surely a man should not burden every hour with his prayers the king who is king of kings <laughs> I know. what do you think of that <laughs> <laughs> why 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 isn't there why why do we not uh you think it's a good explanation for why we don't pray every hour it would be, God would become too much for God. Maybe it would be too much for us, too. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. That's strange. Let's keep going. Antonius came to Rabbi and said, pray for me, Rabbi. May it be heaven's will that you be delivered from cold, Antonius. This prayer makes no sense. Add a garment and the cold goes away. The rabbi said, may it be heaven's will that you be delivered from dry heat, Antonius. Now, this prayer makes sense. Oh, that your prayer could be accepted, for scripture says, nothing can escape the sun's heat. Say, all these things, there's limits to the wisdom, limits to the Roman way of looking at the world, right? God, if it's cold... You know, you can keep putting on more clothes, but yeah. when it's hot, at a certain point, there's not much you can do. Um, and so, I, I don't know what, what it, this is. It's showing the God. All of these are trying to show God is more powerful than even the Roman emperor. So that's my take. Go ahead. When our rabbi entertained Antonius on the Sabbath, he served him cold dishes, which Antonius ate and liked. On another occasion, our rabbi entertained him on a weekday when he served him hot dishes. Antonius said, I found the cold dishes more tasty than the hot. A rabbi, the hot dishes lack one seasoning. Antonius, can there be anything at all lacking in the emperor's pantry? A rabbi, the hot dishes lack Shabbat. Does your pantry have Shabbat? <laughs> He's just really trying to show him that they're Listen. superior. Yeah, that there's this is this is a story, but this is a, a story that gets a lot of uh, play because it's you know why does why does food taste better on Shabbat? Right? It's, it's kind of saying you know that one Shabbat is a time when when our spiritual state is elevated, and so food tastes better when you're in an elevated spiritual state. Um, and so really, what it's saying is that you could be the emperor of Rome and have all the delicacies in the world, but you can't buy spirits. And spirit makes makes things taste better than even the the most delicious uh, Roman delicacy. And so, right, the it's all it's all an argument for the Jewish religion, right? Because the 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 these were already for hundreds of years before this, or right, going all the way back to the story of Hanukkah. And before there were those arguments between the Greeks, Greek culture, and the Jewish culture, because the Greeks looked at the Jews and said, uh, "What's this ridiculousness? You're not eating pork, or why why aren't you?" You know, we only have a God. You only have, your God is invisible. We can't see him. And they spent their time in the gymnasium and working out and becoming strong. And the Jews and the Jews were praying. The Jews, they were, they spent their time praying and they didn't eat pork and they circumcised. And it was a, and so these are, these are part of, uh, I mean, it's hard to believe that he really was talking to the emperor, but scum scholars do think that he had he had this relationship with the emperor. Um, seems more philosophical than that. But let's let's do a few more. Antonius once said to Rabbi, "It is my desire that my son Severus should reign in my stead, and that Tiberius should be declared a Roman colony free of taxes." Were I to make just one request of the sen senators, they would comply. But if there were two requests, I would not. If that rabbi brought a man, had him climb atop his companion, handed the one on top a dove, and then had the one below tell the one on top to let the dove in his hand go free. So Antonius said to himself, it seems that rabbi intimates 
Ask the Senate to confirm my son Severus to reign in my stead and tell Severus that Tiberius is to be made a colony. On another occasion, Antony is said to Rabbi, certain prominent Romans distress me at that Rabbi proceeded to bring him into a garden where on each of several days in Antonius's presence, he pulled out a single radish from the radish patch. Antonius said to himself, it seems that Rabbi intimates, do away with them singly, one at a time, but do not attack them all at once. So Antonius had, had a daughter named Dira who had gone astray. So he sent Rabbi a garden rocket, an herb also known as arugula, intimating that Gira had gone astray. Rabbi in return sent him no. coriander, intimating who slay Barta, the daughter. Antonius then sent Karata, leeks, intimating if so, my line will be Karata, cut off. So in response, Rabbi sent him, <laughs> this is funny, Hasa lettuce, intimating who spare her. Each and every day, Antonius would send Rabbi a leather bag filled with granules of gold topped with a layer of wheat, saying to his messenger, carry this wheat to Rabbi. After a while, Rabbi said, I do not need your gold. I have enough gold of my own. But Antonius answered, then leave it to those who will come after you so they will not be forced to give it as bribes to those who will come after me. Antonius had an underground passage whereby he went from his palace to Rabbi's home house. Every day time he visited Rabbi, he had two slaves with him. One he put to death at the door of Rabbi's house and the other who had been left behind he put to death on his return at the door of his own home. Antony has also said to Rabbi, when I call, make sure no one else is with you. One day when he found Rav Hanina ben Hama sitting there, he said to the rabbi, did I not tell you that no man should be with you when I call? Rabbi Paul replied, he is not an ordinary man. Then said Antony, let him go and summon the servant who is asleep outside the door. Rav Hantania ben Hama went out and found that he was dead. He reasoned, what shall I do? Shall I go and tell Antonius that a servant is dead? It may cost me my life to bring bad news to the emperor. Shall I leave him and run away? I would then be guilty of acting disrespectfully toward royalty. So he besought mercy for the servant, brought him back to life, and sent him in. Said Antonius, I now see that even the least among you can bring the dead back to life. Nevertheless, when I visit, let no one else be with you. Every time Antonius visited, he used to attend Rabbi, waiting on him with food and drink. When Rabbi wanted to get up to his bed, Antonius would crouch in front of him, saying, get up to your bed by stepping on me. Rabbi, however, would demure it is not proper to treat royalty so disrespectfully. Antonius would say, oh, that I might be placed as a mattress under you in the world to come. Once he asked him, will I enter the world to come? Yes, said Rabbi. But said Antonius, is it not written? There shall be no remnant in the house of Esau. That, Rabbi replied, applies only to those descendants of Esau whose evil deeds are like that of Esau. When Antonius died, Rabbi said, the bond of our love is snapped. Whoa. <laughs> Seems like he had this friendship with the Roman yeah, emperor. Yeah, uh, very, very, uh, That he sought his wisdom. That he sought his wisdom. Yeah. And he, the emperor didn't want his people to know much about it, so he killed all the servants who, who witnessed it. That's um, it, so cool. Cruel, yeah. What would be the purpose of killing two servants? Well, he needed servants to go with him, but he didn't want anybody to know that he was going to see the Jewish. That they might tell. They right? might tell. I, I think okay. so. I think that's what oh. that's the. Uh, whoa. So. That's terrible. Yeah. They have no soul. He had no soul. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the. I mean, all of these stories seem to be comparison about. 
comparison of Roman and Jewish values and then and what's what's created. Of course it's written with with uh with our point of view now with theirs. So. Yeah. Go ahead, David, you look like you're about to say something. No, no, no. No, I was thinking that uh, there there may be a part of this where the rabbi is subtly trying to convince him to convert to Judaism too. There's a story of uh, Judah Halevi in front of some kind of an emperor who is trying to do the same thing, and yeah. they have long, long discussions and uh, deep discussions about uh, whether or not he could do that, whether or not he'd want to do that, et cetera. I don't know if that, if this applies. Well, it's that, it's a, a, that's, you're talking to the Kuzari? The, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's kind of like a fictional account, so in some, but it's similar that it's, it's, they're both about the meeting of, even if that, that's a thousand years later, but it's about, the same idea, which is making the philosophical case for Judaism, um, and here, here it's making the philosophical. It's interesting, to break it out. Here it's making the philosophical case for Judaism as opposed to Greek culture, because Greek culture must have felt so much more cosmopolitan and all of these things, and and then evolved. Well, at this point, Jewish culture would have felt very ancient and outdated, and why why follow Jewish culture at all? Um, and then what you're talking about is a thousand years later, Yehuda Levi put into the mouth of the Kuzari, you know, Judaism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all trying to all trying to convince that king to convert, right? That's the the basis of it. And so Judaism, Judaism has this whole case. Why why is Judaism better? Which you know is not the way these days we often think of religion. I mean, not the way I think of religion. Um, the one should be better than the other, but um, for thousands of years, it was it was a contest, right? Who is who has the best religion? So in the Kuzari, the argument of why Judaism is better, one of the main arguments is that we're the only religion where God spoke to everybody in one huge mass revelation, and so it goes on and on about that. But the, right, that Sinai, all those Jews, and then then the Kina, you know, he kind of asked, I think the King asked him, remember, uh, you know, why. How can you be sure that happened? That Mount Sinai ever happened, or really that revelation happened? Um, and then he has so he has a whole philosophical argument, which is actually not a bad argument. But, um, but here, here the here all of these stories uh, put together um, seem to say right: the Jewish people were small, were not very powerful, but we have these values, and then they're more powerful. And here. There's a Roman emperor who's got everything in the entire world, but he's begging to go to the world to come because yeah. he doesn't know, you know, when I die, what's going to happen to me. Um, and yeah. so, I mean, it's, <clears throat> and so to some degree, it's it's uh, symbolic of the kind of material world, even though it's not fully because Judah Levy is doing just fine and well with material goods himself. Um, but... Uh, Anybody else take anything else from these from these stories? About the spice of Shabbat, the spice of Judaism. So. They're kind of different than the other things we were reading. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than the the uh, fiery lashes and all the other fiery <laughs> that we were reading about. That's true. It's a, an, an interesting guy. This is uh Judah. Judah Levi. All right. Well, let's let's continue. We're going to read the story of his death, which is a really uh, long story. So uh, let's go to three twenty eight. Um, with something, it's a long story. Do you want to read it? Or do you want to pass it on? Like right. Annie or David or All right. All right. Here we go. Number three twenty eight. Uh, our masters taught as Rabbi lay dying. He said, "I need to see my sons." When his sons entered, he instructed them. Be sure to accord honor to your mother. My lamp is to burn in its usual place. My table is to be set in its usual place. And my bed is to be spread in its usual place. Joseph of Haifa and Simeon of Ephrath, who attended me in my lifetime, are to attend me at my death. He went on, I need to see the sages of Israel. When the sages of Israel entered, he said to them, do not have me eulogized in the small towns when my funeral procession passes through 
and reassemble the academy after 30 days. My son Simeon is to be counselor sage, my son Gamaliel patriarch, and Hanina ben Hama head of the academy. I need to see my younger son. When Rab Simeon entered, he passed on to him the principles of esoteric wisdom. I need to see my elder son. When Rab Gam Gamaliel entered, he passed on to him the regulations of the patriarch. Patriarchate. My son, he said, surround your patriarchate with the people of distinction and discipline students with severity. On the day Rabbi appeared to be on the verge of death, the sages decreed a public fast to beseech God's mercy for the continuance of Rabbi's life. They also threatened, he who says that Rabbi is dead will be stabbed, stabbed with a, a sword. Rabbi's handmaiden went up to the roof and prayed, they on high desire, they on high desire Rabbi to join me and those below desire Rabbi to remain with them. May it be God's will that those below prevail over those above. But when she saw that he was in great pain, she prayed, may it be God's will that those above prevail over those below. However, since the sages did not cease praying for God's mercy to extend Rabbi's life, she picked up a jar and threw it from the roof to the ground. Startled at the noise made by the smashed jar, the sages ceased their prayers for an instant, and the soul of Rabbi departed. But not knowing that Rabbi had died, the sages said to Bar Kapara, go and find out. He went, and upon finding that Rabbi was dead, he, with head covered and garments rent, walked over to the window of the room where Rabbi lay, looked out, and began the announcement, saying, Our brethren of the family of Judea, hear me, hear me. Angels and the just, who are earth's foundations, grip the holy ark. The angels prevailed over the just, who are earth's foundations. The holy ark is taken captive. The sages asked, is Rabbi dead? Bar Kapara, you have said it. I did not say it. They rent their garments and the sound of their rending reached as far as Gopapata, a distance of three mil from Sephoris. As he lay dying, Rabbi stretched his 10 fingers toward heaven and said, Lord of the universe, to you it is revealed and known that with all my 10 fingers, I labored hard to perform Torah's precepts that I did not derive any worldly benefit, not even as little as may be enjoyed by the smallest finger. May it be your will that there be peace in my last resting place. A divine vo voice came forth and said, he shall enter into peace. He shall have rest on his couch. The day Rabbi di died, a divine voice came forth and said, Whoever was present at Rabbi's death is destined for life in the world to come. There was a fuller who used to visit Rabbi every day, but did not visit him on that day. When he heard the voice, he went up to the roof, threw himself to the ground, and died. Again, a div divine voice came forth and said, The fuller also is destined to life in the world to come. He's got a... Why would he do special that? dispensation? <laughs> he was upset that he didn't. He was the one day he missed was a day where he would have had guaranteed a world to come. Ah, I see. <laughs> so he, he took these things seriously. Yeah, right. That's what we got to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, jumping off the roof. Well, it, it's it's interesting that the first group, or the first person that comes to see him, gives him esoteric wisdom. Okay, and uh, uh, so is that the deepest form of wisdom? Is that more than the uh, observance kind of stuff, the halakas kind of stuff? Um, is is that what they're saying, or is it not as not as uh, uh, golden as that, so to speak? I mean, it, it is interesting that he's se he's separating right the the. Uh, the knowledge, right, into the patriarchate, which isn't the halakha, but it's like the political knowledge, the one who's going to be like the ruler. And so the one who he thinks he needs to give the mystical 
is not the same person who he says, you're going to be the ruler after me. So he's making a, a clear distinction between what's needed to be the maybe yeah, the mystical the earthly stuff, stuff and the divine stuff, so to speak. And the, the earthly stuff and the divine stuff. And, and it's true, he goes, he gives to his younger son first. Um, and so I, I, I don't know. I mean, the, you, you're saying because he goes to him first, does that mean that it's of more value? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. I mean, now, it could be. The other question is, do you have to have the divine wisdom in order to go to the world to come? Or is that something that is beyond your being able to organize it no matter what? You got to earn it. But uh, I mean, the the... It's interesting all these stories of the world to come, and it's on my mind because next week I'm, I'll be interviewed for a TV channel to talk about Judaism in the world to come, um, and the way what Judaism thinks about, about it. But I, I, I mean, what if I were to ask you in Judaism, how do you get the world to come? What would you, what would you say from just from your, kind of sense of how do you what how do you how do you get how do you get how do you how do you get to the world to come when you die? Well, who, who are you asking? I'm saying <laughs> you, David. I'm asking David. I'm asking you, Norma, too, and Mbani, or because I mean, in Christianity, it's more clear, right? It, the days. theological, well, the theological is if you, right? I mean, Diane, it's if you to to go to heaven. Every is it every church has a different idea of what you need to do to go to heaven, or is it is it pretty similar to in all? If you if you if you accept it's... if you're baptized, right? Isn't it just by being baptized you go to heaven? No, <laughs> well, no. So to to go to heaven, you have to live a good life. You have to, you know, be devoted to God. That's how you get to heaven. All right. There's a man on TV, a uh, commercial. His name last name is Jeremiah. Uh, is Jeremiah? <clears throat> to me, he seems very crazy. But his book, thirty one chapters, tells you that in a very short time, something is going to come down from heaven like an explosion and grab up all the good people and take them up to heaven and the rest of the people will be left here to suffer. I mean, and this is a commercial on television. It's really? freaky. Somebody has to be a lot of money. He must have a lot of money. Yeah, when, he up, uh, he's a, a pastor of some the, kind. The, 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 the born-again Christians have a notion for that. What's that called? The rescue? or The... Uh, the, uh, tr uh, the the rapture. Rapture. The rapture. The rapture. The rapture. The rapture. Yeah. That's what he says. The rapture will come and take yeah. us. Not me, but those people that he designates. I, you know, the the go, going with what probably Maimonides is saying, but he's not saying it directly in the in the guide for the perplexed, is that you're born with the possibility of uh, of a soul that may exist after you die. And it's through various procedures, various studies, various changes in your nature that this soul becomes sort of alive and real and then can last after you die for some period of time. I, I'm not sure what period of time, but for some period of time. It may not be eternal, it may be eternal, but you have to construct it. That's the whole notion. You have to build this yourself. So if you don't spend time building it yourself, then you're not going to go to the world to come. This, this is Maimonides' this perspective that I got out of the guide for the perplexed. It's his, well, there are distinctions between spirit and soul that he makes. And, and it, it's, it's within those distinctions that this notion comes up. So it's interesting because in, in, in Kabbalah, they kind of say the, the place where you the place where you spend your days in, right? And if you if you take up all your life and the place where your mind now dwells, you know, um, that's the place. It's like a radio frequency, right? Where your mind is, it's like a radio frequency for where you go, where you pass away. So if you spend your life in a good place, then your mind gets drawn to go to a good place. 
if you spend your mind in not a very high place, in a low place, and you get drawn to a low place. Mm -hmm. And all those things, it's kind of like what you're building is, so by study, by good deeds, by prayer, you're trying to uh, make sure that you're vibrating in a higher, in a higher way, and then you just get drawn. And so the, in Kabbalah, the, the, the language they use is of a, you have a coat, and there's a coat, it's a, they say it's like a coat that's made out of all your deeds, of all your thoughts, of all your actions. And, there, and, and every time, and if your coat is beautiful and kind of pristine, then it kind of like takes you out to that kind of place. But if your coat is tattered and, you know, messed up, then that's, then, then I mean, Judaism doesn't believe you, you're forever going to eternal hell, but uh, rather that you, you go through a period where your coat has to get cleaned. And it might not be too pleasant, but after a certain amount of time, your coat is clean and you can go on to the next thing uh, too. But uh, uh, the, the, the Buddhists have the same sort of notion, actually. The, the, the noga, I think, which is the Hebrew for the coat, is something that gets worn off after approximately 500 years in a place that they call Devachina. So what happens is you go to Devachina, hang out for 500 years, get the get the, the, the get beatings, get essentially the shit kicked out of you, and then you uh, literally, and then what happens is you're ready to either be reborn or to hang around there for periods of time. I, I, I think that people spend, you know, the interesting thing for me is that every religion where people have spent huge amounts of time on this and really devoted themselves to thinking about this and thinking about it not in an objective way, but in a very, very personal way, thinking, you know, trying to fiddle with themselves inside to see what these things might be, they all come up with similar, similar results. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a good sign that, you know, if, if there's similar results across huge cultures, maybe there's something to that. Well, the, the, Buddhist, the, Buddhist ver, the Buddhist vision of hell is actually much, much worse than the worst Catholic vision of hell. <laughs> much more. The way they torture you is described in much more detail and much more extensive and uh, much so... Uh, I actually would I actually would probably take the the Catholic one over the Buddhist version of yeah, and the Buddhists are so so kind and that's nice. because of that vision of hell. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. yeah. I don't want to. Uh, wow. But the but it, it's interesting, right? Because the I talked about this one Yom Kippur, but the Rab Doctor Eben Alexander was like one of these people who had a, a famous near death experience, and he was a. Uh, you know, neuroscientist and his right. mind completely shut down and there was no brain activity and nothing could explain his experience. And so at the beginning of his experience, I'm not sure if it's hell, but he goes to a place where he kind of feels like he's underground and he's just, it's like, just like a little piece of consciousness surrounded by earth. And it's, he, he has no thought except survival and he feels dirty and grungy. He feels like he's a mole kind of, you know, like it's all dark, it's horrible. And he's just in this place and he's just like, just like that's just where his consciousness was and then suddenly you heard almost like this divine music and his soul gets and he goes up into the expanses and suddenly he's in the light and he's in this beautiful place and he's flying around and so to me that feels like almost like a better you know like a kind of more experiential description of what hell what it would be like to be in a very kind of narrow consciousness place when you pass away or, you know place of feeling like you're really like oh you know like your mind you're surrounded by just, you know, like really denseness and narrowness and kind of feel, just feel like awful, like you're a mole underground surrounded by. Do you know the Orthodox that bury people and have the body rot properly? Uh, I've often thought that maybe they're looking for this sort of low, the, the hell experience right in the beginning. Sort of so there's a certain remnant of of your being that's left in your body, this tiny little bit of consciousness that has to work its way out as your body rots and sort of pops into something better if you're lucky. Let me get over it quickly. Well, I don't know, yeah. but no, no, no. But you know, as as one thinks of whether you what kind of death, you know, we're getting close to that particular point in our lives, so we got to think of what kind of death 
you want? You know, what kind of burial do you want? Do you want more or less an Orthodox Jewish burial where you're buried in a coffin that has no nails, only wood, and the nails, because they're electromagnetic conductors, you know, if there's any kind of uh, buzziness to this uh, to this consciousness, it's going to interfere with it. So you want, you know, you you, you want the rotting to uh, the rotting to happen quite naturally, or do you want to be cremated? You know, with cremation, there's no rotting at all. Uh, and the Jews were uh, very much against cremation. What about the conservative Jews? Do they do any cremation these days, or that? that... Sure they do. Yeah, yeah, they do. I mean, it's not; it's still a taboo, but uh, you know, or the different reasons. But actually, I mean, one of them was that so many Jews died through the years through being burned alive. So it's considered to be a uh, why would you want to burn the body? Um, and that what happened in the Holocaust reinforced that taboo many fold, right? It was being burned in the ovens. But there were other ideas too. One was that uh, you should respect the dead and take care of it, and burning up the dead did not. But there was also kind of similar to what you were saying, there was this, there was this idea that if you die and decompose, that there was this belief at the end of days that all the bones, right, the dry bones, the bones would come back to life and grow skin and sinews and and if you're and and then and then then you then you go to Jerusalem. So one of the reasons you want to get buried in Jerusalem is that you have a much shorter journey to get to Jerusalem. <laughs> and if you're buried if you're buried over here, you, you have to this is the way it describes to tunnel your way all the way to Jerusalem. And that sounds really a, unpleasant. Yeah. <laughs> and, but if you're if you're if you but if your bones are if you're just cremated then I don't know what happens then. Then you don't get to be resurrected at the end of days. Of course, the the Kabbalists they were a little bit more. My they they didn't believe that in the resurrection of the dead, and they, they didn't believe there was any spirit in the body because they said that once you die, your spirit. Um, the reason you have the shiva, right, the seven days after death in Judaism, where you is because during those days your spirit is kind of like you know they say that when a person a person's limb is cut off. God forbid, you almost have a phantom limb sy syndrome where you still think you have your right. limb, right? You still yeah, believe they, you have a limb. You feel it. You feel it. You actually feel it like you still have your limb. So they say that's what it's like for the soul. The soul believes it's still in the body. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like hovering over like where it used to live and kind of like, whoa, what do I do? But, but to see all of the people mourning makes it realize what happened and sends it to love to have the peace and then be willing to continue on in this journey. And then it gets sucked up into uh, the passageway between this world and the next world. Um, and so, but it, uh, in, right, in Kabbalah, you, the, the soul leaves the body and the body is, you know, the soul goes on. To the Some years ago, I used to hang out with a mathematician from Argonne. And he, had, he and his friends there in their spare time conducted an experiment to see if the soul had weight. Okay, so they put a mouse, they sealed the mouse into a, into a completely, uh, into a glass jar. And in the glass jar, they had a pellet of potassium cyanide that dropped at a certain point into a bed of hydrochloric acid, which gave off hydrocyanic gas, which killed the mouse immediately. Now that whole thing was in a sealed jar sitting on a very, very sensitive scale. And at the moment the rat died, in fact, the weight dropped a small, small amount. So th this, this was the... <laughs> Now, why, why this guy at Argonne National Labs was fooling around like that? I mean, who knows? But, but anyway, this was a certain proof that the soul had had some kind of weight to it, which is an interesting notion. Well, they, they've done those studies of human beings too, not uh, killing them, but you know, people who are on their deathbeds. There's some like fifty something grams or something. There's a well, the other day I saw a lady wearing what I thought was a mezuzah, a beautiful sterling silver, yeah. about this big. And I said, oh, that is beautiful. And I didn't look Jewish, so I wasn't sure. I didn't want to say, is it a mezuzah? I said, oh, what is that? That's lovely. She said, those are my husband's ashes. I wear them. <laughs> <laughs> that was really strange. Real devotion. 
Yeah, right. Wow. Think, are you are you hoping for uh, that kind of devotion? Is that what you're saying? Yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> That's weird. You know the uh, yeah. I mean the ashes too, right? The, I mean, in, but it's interesting because in the east, right, in 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 where they do they do have cremation, right? So obviously, it's very popular in India and yes, in blue. part of it is such hot countries, maybe, and you know the rotted bodies. But but when a purse when a spiritual teacher reaches enlightenment, then they don't cremate them; they bury them. Um, in many of those traditions, mm -hmm. and they believe that if you bury them, this is what they do in some Indian traditions. A person who has reached enlightenment upon death, they dig a grave, and they put that person in a in the meditative position, the body. They stick it in the grave, and they fill the grave with ashes and all kinds of special. It's like a whole like a, a series of special things you do, and then you build stone around it. And their and their belief is that if you do that, then the good vibrations of that dead master will continue for thousands of years. Um, you know, and then to, to, to send to all the people around to overcome a blessing. Uh, and so I remember once a story of one of those graves that then was dug up by someone and he dug it up because he wanted to build something there and so he dug it up and apparently he died the next day. Whoa. But, uh, oh. uh, but so, so it's interesting, so yeah, you don't want to, you have the idea not to not to cremate because um, you want to go back from the ashes to the ashes. But maybe or all these are, who knows what what's in, what is what what what's really it sounds like a science fiction story. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, all, kinds of, all kind of things, all kind of funny things happen. Well, let let let's finish the stories of his death since we're we're here. Um, um, where were we? Where are we? On 329? Yeah, we're on 329. Um, so let's, let's skip, uh, let, 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 we might as well read, we'll read, we'll just do three, 329, um, and then keep going, yeah. When Rabbi fell ill, Rabbi Hia visited him and found him weeping. Master, he asked, why are you weeping? Have we not learned when a man dies smiling, it is a good omen for him when he dies weeping. It is a bad omen. It is a bad omen for him, Rabbi replied. I weep because I am about to part from Torah and her precepts. When Rabbi mm -hmm. Judah, the patriarch died, Rabbi Yanai proclaimed, the restrictions on priests do not hold today. After Rabbi died, humility and fear of sin ceased. Rabbi Haya said, the day Rabbi died, holiness ceased. Rabbi Haya also said, whenever I see Rabbi's grave, I shed tears over it. Whenever, whenever Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Haya were in a dispute, Rabbi Hanina would say to Rabbi Haya, do you presume to dispute with me? If, God forbid, the Torah were forgotten in Israel, I could restore it by my dialectical power. Rabbi Haya would reply, but I see to it that the Torah is not forgotten in Israel. What do I do? I go and sow flax, make nets from the flax cords, and trap deer whose flesh I give to orphans, and out of whose skins I prepare scrolls upon which I write the five books of Moses. Then I go to a town that has no teachers for the young and teach the five books to five children and the six divisions of Mishnah to six young people. And I, see to, I say to them, until I return, read scripture to one another and recite Mishnah to one another. Thus, I see to it that the Torah is not forgotten in Israel. It is to such preoccupations of Rabbi Haya that Rabbi referred when he said, how great are the words of Haya. When Rabbi Simeon, son of Rabbi, asked his father, greater than yours, he replied, yes. When Rabbi Ishmael, son of Rabbi Yose, asked Rabbi, even greater than my father's, he replied, 
God forbid such a thing should not be said in Israel. That's his humility. But uh, it's a uh, the story above there about Rabbi Chia is 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 also a, a well known one. And it's you know how do you how do you pass on tradition, right? And then so with this is it where we come to the end of our story of of Rabbi and he created right the Mishnah and put down into writing um, all of the uh, the teachings that came before. And so their 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 job was to ensure that Judaism survived. Uh, all these early generations, and to ensure that Judaism was passed down from generation to generation. So he says, "Well, how do you how do you ensure that the Torah is not forgotten in Israel?" That was their job to ensure it because the all the the temple was destroyed, the people were in exile, everything had changed. How do you ensure it? Um, so he goes and says, "I sow flax and make nets nets from the flax cores and trap deer, whose flesh I give to orphans." Um, and to make the skin, so he makes sure that uh, uh, there's all the materials for this for the thing himself. And then he goes and he teaches it. And when he was, when there's a town that has no teachers, he teaches the five books to five children, and the division of Mishnah to six young people. And he said, just teach it to each other. And so there's a this becomes our our scholarly tradition in Judaism. And it's amazing we continue. We're two thousand years after this, but basically even in the most right obscure small shtetls around the world, right? Small little villages. And we kept teaching ourselves the basics of Judaism, kept it going. Um, and uh, and then in kind of in the same way, right? You find a teacher, you just try to teach it to the kids and you give them the value and you hope at least one or two pick it up. And they kind of always do, right? There's always, it's always interesting in that in every community, there's always a few kids who really just fall in love with it and become little mini rabbis, right? And Teach it yeah. up and love, love the whole, love the whole thing, and then that's how we, we kept it going amidst very difficult circumstance for so long. Um, and we see what was in this story. What we see also is the his great humility, and that uh, one of the values that we've the most, uh, well, one holding on to how important it is to have knowledge, to be wise and smart, and Torah and learn and an education. Also, humility at the same time, um, and that when you have both, then you really have uh, a powerful, a powerful combination. Um, and I think this rabbi's stories were kind of different than some of the others, but through them we've seen um, that he would, he would, despite being such a great leader, we see through these stories of his death what a great, how honored he was. Um, even you don't always know how exactly factual that it all is but you can you can sense how honored he was but how humble he was for all of it and, um, and humility is also a method by the way you know it, it isn't done just for uh, sort of appearances or even for whatever but it's done to uh, if you fill yourself up with yourself there's no space in yourself for the descent of the shekhinah that, that was the that was that's one of the notions. So if if you're filled up with yourself, full of pride, full of uh, reflections of yourself, there you, you leave nothing for an opening. You leave nothing that isn't yourself for something other than yourself. It's uh, it's very it's very true. The uh... what is Shahin? Shekhinah is the divine the divine presence or the female uh, exactly. presence of God. So God, basically God's, you know, God's spirit or but on some level, but even it's more specific, but you, you have to empty yourself first if you want real divine wisdom to come into you. And then if you're full of yourself, then, then all you have is yourself. I say that prayer every night before I go to bed. The Holy Ghost, okay, for D Diane. He, uh, it's, it's a very similar structure in uh, Catholicism is the Holy Ghost. Is it like similar to like, you know, when they would, like in the book of Judges, when they say the spirit would come upon somebody, is that, you know? Um, it, it, it is, it isn't, it isn't. I mean, I mean, yeah, there, there is that sense of God coming down onto a person. I mean, the way I see it personally is that there's a specific kind of experience of God coming down and overshadowing a person which is what happens in Judges with Saul and others. 
But in general, I think this is just a law of, of spirituality, which is you have to empty yourself. Part of it is empty your own mind so that there's something else. But even more than your mind, you know, your your ego, your sense of self, um, it crowds it crowds your being. And for God to come into your being, you have to empty your your sense of self um, and and make make room for it. Um, part of it, the humility, humility of not thinking you know everything opens a door for God to come in. I think that's part of it too. When you don't think, right? The God, Kutzka Rebbe says, where, do, where does God dwell wherever you let him in? And how do you let God in? By, you know, emptying your sense of, I know everything, I know I'm in charge, and I'm doing everything. And so that when you... Diane, yeah. it's so nice that you want to learn with us. I like yeah. it so much. Yeah, it's so nice to have you with us. Well, I find this I find this class so I, I was telling Ed, I, I've I, I just I'm overwhelmed with things that I learn here. Really, truly. It's nice. fantastic. I appreciate it so much. Well, so nice, nice to have you with us. And we'll we'll see where we'll see where we go next after this. Okay. Thanks everyone. Have a nice day. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye. Safe travels. Thank you.